Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another exciting adventure of American Snippets Live. <laughs> I'm sure tonight's guest doesn't really need an introduction, and we'll hang out a little bit for people who maybe have lost patience and screw them. They can come yeah, back, yeah. right? They're lost. Right? <laughs> it was well worth the wait because now we have two O'Neills. <laughs> yeah, we. I had to get him in to help with the troubleshooting because he's the brains and obviously the looks in the family. I'm just the uh, clearly. stuff taken care of. It's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, I love it. The more people there, bring everybody in. We'll just rock it and have like a little party. That's the fun of doing this. You know, we're not exactly Fox News or anybody like that. We can just have fun, um, you know, along the way because there's plenty of life that isn't fun. So you may as well just go with it. So. Yes, tonight's guest doesn't really need much of an introduction. Rob O'Neill, I got to see you, to hear you and see you speak at one event many moons ago. And uh, then I got to bump into you. You were so nice that night when my boys and I were at the Rangers game with Foles of Honor. And so, you know, they, you got a text like, hey, can you come meet? And then all of a sudden there were like 19 of us coming down to your suite. And well, that was the like, night that I'd been, I'd been working with the Vancouver Canucks. I wasn't going to mention that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've been working with them a little bit, and then they came into town, and so they got me a nice jersey and all that good stuff. And, and uh, like, even the NYPD were yelling at me, like, hey, why, why aren't you uh, wearing <laughs> Rangers stuff? I'm like, hey, man, I'm, I'm not in the payroll with the Rangers yet. You, you got to check out. <laughs> in hockey, he's still a free agent. Yeah, I'm, in I'm hockey, free agent. Still a free agent. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't going to bring that up, but you did, so – you know, rock on. We, uh, it was still well worth it. And we have the pictures and uh, my kids who are hard to impress sometimes were like, Oh my God, we just met Rob freaking like even they who knew you were. So I'm sure that's not exactly everything you've aspired to be like the only reason you've aspired to be, but that's another thing in my world, which was cool. Thank you. So Rob, let's say hello to your brother sitting there. This is my brother, Tom, Tom O'Neill. He's in town. We're doing some radio stuff. Tom's been in radio for about a little over two decades. So we were doing a couple of things here. We're collaborating on a few projects and he, uh, he's, he's here. We're, um, walked around, got some pizza, got some, some, you ever had schmackeries cookies? Oh my schmackeries goodness. Cookies. No. Yeah. It's on 44th. As good as it sounds. It's on 44th and 9th. Um, unreal. Uh, schmackeries cookies. Schmackeries, like S C S C H M A C K E R Y something. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Okay. So we walked around, we got, we got pizza, we got schmackeries and then that's about it. And then we're going to, roll out and some stuff to just to, to uh later in the week but we did that and it's fun so this is tom o'neill I, I actually started introducing him and started getting into cookies i like cookies <laughs> <laughs> everybody likes what kind of cookies uh <laughs> my favorite kind of cookie is actually a brownie which is so they made a german chocolate brownie just for him i get to, there's a thing called funfetti and then there's a cookies and cream which is like it's it's like what I'm getting I'm getting eyeballed. <laughs> My German it's chocolate like, brown. What the hell is. kind of interview is this? It's a, it's our kind of interview. That's what it is. Okay, so we'll circle back around. You, um, yeah. we will obviously touch on what you wind up talking about so often, but I really want to move beyond that as well because you are so much more than those experiences. You know, there's. There's just so much about it. You've lived a long, full life. You ha had a huge career and you're doing incredible things now. I love all of it. So, um, I mean, you started, I got your book and I wound up, I was so excited. I hit click twice and I got two of them. So we're going to um, go ahead and offer out a copy of this book. I'm going to pop it in the mail and send it to somebody. The first 10 people who leave a review on this podcast, when we post it on American <laughs> Snippets, I'll put your name in a hat and I'll send out one of these books. And then if we get all 10 reviews in like the first two days, I'll just mail everybody a book, all 10 people a book because um, Very cool. I love the book and oh. it's great. We like the support and the reviews are also pretty freaking awesome. So moving on, Rob, you guys grew up in Butte, Montana. Yes. Yeah. So I made it out to Montana for the first time in my, in my life just a couple months ago. We didn't make it out to Butte, but man, I've always wanted to go to Montana and it's so beautiful. At least the part we were in. And I know you talk about it like you couldn't wait to get out, but everybody can't wait to get out of the small town that they grew up in. And it seems like you also enjoy going home now, like to visit, to hang out. You got your bar, you got your people. No? Well, it's funny because um, my wife, Jessica, was from New England. I, I, we're from Butte, Montana, which is basically the only not really beautiful city in <laughs> Montana. Uh, I sh I'll and take your so picture. Oh, go ahead. 
<laughs> so we were, you know, so we were, um, I, I finally took it to uh, Big Sky, which is yes. one of the most beautiful. And we're standing there in this, uh, this, this, this lodge that we had. She's staring out at the sunset over these mountains covered in snow. We're going to go skiing in Big Sky. She was, without realizing it, she said, uh, oh, my God, Montana's so beautiful. This is nothing like Butte. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, but no, Butte is quite all the, all the parks, uh, uh, Glacier Park, uh, 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 Yellowstone Park, uh, uh, Big Sky Discovery, Bridger Bowl, the, the hunting, the fishing, it's a, it's a great place. Love it. Nice. So, Tom, tell us a story about your beloved brother from childhood that he probably doesn't want you to tell us. He had uh, cheated to win a Super Tech Mobile. Oh, come on. I won every single game. That was that interception. That was, flag <laughs> that was not a flag. That was a flag. That was a video game. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> a story, let's see. Um, well, a lot of people don't know that. Well, they know that he was a college basketball player. Um, this isn't really embarrassing. He, uh, as a junior in high school, he went to John Stockton's basketball camp. That's true. And, um, you know, going against kids from Seattle, Spokane, all the bigger cities around there. He came home and won the MVP. Of the, nice. whole, the whole camp and won the one on one competition. That's true. So we were all sorry. Yeah. Let me, let me, is there, is there, is there a link I can tweet out to this? I can put it out to my followers and let us know we're talking some, some great yeah, talk. Yeah, that here. would be, that would, we're having a great talk. Um, Dave, can you text him the link? I have an idea. Can you text him the link to this page? To this page so he can tweet out to his followers that we're doing this interview. I, a lot yes. of people call him followers. I call them minions. Minions. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure he they does. enjoy He's that. Oh, I'm totally kidding. Yeah, give me, give me that. Let's tweet it out. Let yeah, me get you. people. What? Send it to Rob. I'm going to give you the cell phone here. Text it to Rob. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Come back. Mm -hmm. sure. All right. So here on American Snippers, you guys are getting used to how we were. Does anybody have any questions for Rob while we go? We, we will get serious and get into this in a minute, but sometimes. Oh, yeah. There's no reason to get serious. Fun, more fun not to get serious. So um, I'm just going to hit get this number back up so that here, that's his number. Text him the, uh, the, the link. All right. Awesome. So Butte, Montana. And you guys, you had like kind of a badass work ethic. Did you guys all have to do that? I was reading that stuff. I grew up, right? My dad. He was pretty tough. Like we worked a lot and I worked on horse farms and I, like, I thought we worked a lot, but I was reading the stuff that you guys did. I was like, damn, like these guys are no joke, man. But how did, how does that all come about? Like, and does everybody work like that? Or are you just some kind of like super freaky work? Just ethic? Some. It's, it's, <laughs> it's just me, Barb. It's not, <laughs> we've, uh, we're, we're very lucky. You know, I, I'm, uh, Rob and my father were both basketball players. I was more of a distance runner, but it, it didn't matter what sport we were in or what, what uh, our interests yeah, were. Yeah, Tom was an all-state cross-country runner. It's funny. Uh, so when he was like 17, faster than hell, um, just thin and whatever, and I ran into him after I got out of the Navy. I'm like, Tom, you're still running? He goes, depends on who's chasing me. <laughs> Always a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, you're running, uh, to whatever you're running from. We always had uh, our, our dad was always really supportive. And very he, he he wouldn't it was he wasn't a taskmaster. He he would, he would make us want to achieve, and he he would train with us. He'd, he'd race with us, or he'd uh, play basketball with Rob. We we always it was always very supportive. Never anything we had to do or ever any you know, directive like that at all. Awesome. So um, I'm not ignoring you, but I'm just getting I'm getting this. So I, I mean, can, you're uh, kind of ignoring me, but that's okay. It's for a good. No, reason. No, no. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. I'm not over here. <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Man, what Batman game is that? He's, he's <laughs> oh my God. I sort of feel like I'm sitting here with my kids right now. I'm right at home. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, some huge kids. I'm just figuring it out. <laughs> yeah, just figuring out. He's just figuring out everybody. So while we're at it, um, Dave, does anybody have any questions that they've popped up for Rob? Or apparently his brother Tom will spill all too. So let's get him. Mm -hmm. have, have a drink. Let's make it real. Oh, let's do this. Yeah, let's do it. Hang no questions right yet? All right, this is your chance, you people. Whoever's at watching. Me, at, at Mikuya. Yep. Hang on, a second. Hang on a sec. All right. He's popping it up. And we're going to, uh, you know, we'll repost this as a as a podcast too later on. And yours truly oh, is going to write another feature tweeted. article on you. Tweet it. Awesome. A tweet is always a dangerous word for me to say. I always mispronounce it. it. Comes out a different word. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's so funny when you're saying that because I was like, I'm thinking the past tense of tweeted and it almost came out like, of something different. What's the past tense? Exactly. The past tense should not be tweeted. It should be the other word. I, <laughs> See? <laughs> I'm just saying. This is, these are the problems <laughs> I have in life, right? Okay. So I also read, you know, through this book, there was that friend, that, I'll put friend in quote, because who the hell says that to you? Said that you have a thousand percent chance that you will not make it into the Navy SEALs or through the Navy SEALs. Oh, I, I think I said that about myself, but everyone else thought it was uh, less than that. Everyone because it's too, uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where you, it's, you sort of see it in movies and you see it on TV and it's, it's break glass in case of war. It's never a normal person that makes it through. But what you find out the further you get along is it is the normal people that make it through. It's the people with humility and a, and a positive attitude. Yeah. And, uh, it's not getting from one year to 10 years. It's getting from breakfast to lunch. And can I make it to dinner? And I, boy, I can't wait to get back in the same bed that I fell asleep in today. And tomorrow I do the whole thing over again. It's one day at a time, one meal at a time. Yeah. So, I mean, how do you even exist in like a constant state of readiness? Like I mean, your day goes from such extremes. And I think one of the best examples of that that I saw in there was like that morning you're at the Easter party at preschool. At like yeah. whatever, nine o'clock in the morning, and then in the afternoon, you're off to go like kill some pirates and like rescue. Well, we were actually we were actually <laughs> off uh, four hours after we got the message, and I was in my dad's classroom on my birthday, which is Good Friday, April tenth. Oh, and um, we had been we had been selling to the army that if you call us, we can we will be from the time you call us to what we call wheels up in four hours. And we've been selling it for years, but we've never done it. And we were actually uh, wheels up in three hours and 59 minutes. Jeez, that's so like we kind of had a Domino's pizza. Again. We had it done in a minute. And um, it wasn't so much, you know, what are we going to do when we get there? Is can we meet this first time? And I need to be work, to, to be to work in a certain amount of time. We need to have everyone. We're talking about two airplanes full of people, parachutes, boats, bullets, bombs, whatever we carry to war. And we need to take off. And so our, our first goal is a certain amount of time. Our second goal is four hours. And then once we take off, now we worry about how do we rescue this hostage because no one's ever done this before, ever. So we're going to do it. What We have 16 hours before we're in the Indian Ocean, so somebody think of something quick. Um, because the, the, we've been training on everything from um, nuclear-powered ships to cruise liners to yachts to everything, but no one ever thought of a fully engulfed um, rest, or a, a life raft being towed by a Navy cruiser. So how do we get this? There's a, a door to get in this big. How do we get in there? There's three pirates, all have guns, are aimed at one guy. How can we do it? So we just we started thinking of the best plans, and we came up with the best plans over the next sixteen hours, and then we put snipers down to watch them. Then we're gonna we're going to do the best plan, and the snipers took the shots because something dangerous happened. That wasn't even one of the plans. So it's yeah. it's it's just uh, who's ready? Who's and, ready? And um, when we think think about the guys who took the shots, they they were in their beds in Virginia Beach. You know, the, not expecting to do this on a it was a long weekend. Um, why were their guns sighted in for the most? difficult shots they'd ever take just because they were ready. They were prepared. And that's, that's kind of the type of people they were. And it's be, it's, everyone tried to do that because you never knew it was going to happen. So try to be prepared for anything. You don't expect anything. Yeah. So is that a hard state of being to kind of, do you ever step out of that state well, of being? It's, well, I do now, but it's not at the time because everyone around you is doing the same thing. So it's right. normal. Exceptionalism is normal. And it, it was like, I remember being, there were times in the team room where one of my teammates made worldwide headlines and I'd see him the next day and say, dude, that was awesome what you did. Congratulations. He'd say, yeah, thanks. You want to go to the gym? I'm like, yeah, let's do it. That's it. After the gym, you want to go to the ready room and have a couple of bears? Yeah, let's do that too. And just because everyone was continually doing that and nobody, it, it, nobody realizes what they're doing in the bubble until they leave the bubble. And looking back, I was telling my brother earlier today, it's like, he was asking me the effects of the war and I'm like, it's so I'm so separated from it now. It's not. It's it's like there, there's no way any of that happened. I just know the story. Yeah. There, there's no like way. Someone else, but, but, like someone else lived it. Yeah, but, but men and women are doing men and women are doing it right now, and it yeah. doesn't seem exceptional to them until they get out. And it's right. Exceptional. And then they're very, very very and they're and like I said they're doing it right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those. I mean, that's, that's, nothing, nothing this cool, but no, <laughs> kind of. Of course not. Of course. Not. <laughs> It'll never be as cool. Um, all right. So 
your book then, and we're just going to kind of bounce around because I got so many yeah, different sure. things that, and we'll see how, how it goes through. And if something else pops up that's on your mind that you definitely want to mention, just toss it in there. Um, and you too, Tom, whatever pops up. <laughs> All right. This is fun. Okay. So your, your book, first off, um, you took some heat for sharing your story. And this is something uh, I can relate to on a different level, right? But what is it like? Like, that's your your life, your story, you lived it. And people are giving you crap for telling your story and your experiences, or they're talking smack about you. Um, not everybody, but you know, enough where their voices as yeah, well, uh, at first it's troublesome because we were in a, a very uh, quiet community that no one really knew anything. Well, I mean, but when you think back to it, let me, let me bounce around a little too. They're like, you know, Navy SEALs don't write books. I'm like, I know I read that in like 80 Navy SEAL books. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, at first, you know, from your, from your peers with whom you've been to war, you, you, you want their respect and you wonder why they're doing it. But then it gets to a point where it's like, um, especially with Navy SEALs, it's like, you know, if I took 10 of you guys at random yeah. and I got 10 dump trucks of money and I dumped cash Full of, you know, dump trucks full of cash in each one of your driveways. Six of you would complain your driveway's blocked. Yeah. <laughs> don't worry about the cash. You just can't. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those, you know, ever, have you ever been to a military history section of a Barnes and Nobles? Uh, actually, surprisingly, I have. Yeah. There's a lot of soldiers and sailors and airmen and Marines who've written books. Yes. And I think, honestly, now, like, if, 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 if tactics aren't being told and people aren't put in danger, there's nothing wrong with telling history. Right. I'm very happy that I know what happened on Iwo Jima. I love the stories of Operation Overlord when they invaded yeah. Northern France. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, the, the stories of Vietnam. People need to know stuff. There's nothing wrong with knowing your history, knowing your heritage, knowing as, as long as no one gets harmed. And like, I wrote a book, and if, if 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 someone who read my book, the operator doesn't know that Navy SEALs get on helicopters and sometimes go into houses and kill bad guys, you're just misinformed, man. Turn, turn the Kardashians yeah. back. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and speaking of, so this book is actually, so I've been a book nerd like my life because I had no friends. That's why I started reading. But and now, then I kept reading because I like reading. And now I write books as well and I write articles. So coming from both sides, coming as from like a writer, author, and someone who just likes to read, your book's really well written. And uh, thank you. I, maybe I shouldn't have been so surprised when I read it. But right? <laughs> that's what. Like, so I don't know if that's like a rude question to ask, but like, I mean, did you have even beta readers reading it or did you like? No, we, I had a really good team with, the, with, um, I'd always taken journals. My, my, my father, our father, who always, our father, who are not Who not He, um, he'd always been saying, my, my father's always been convinced that everything that ever happened as a Navy SEAL, I did it. Even from the time I was in training, there was a Life Magazine article that was written like a year before I got there. And he's looking at the one guy tied up with his back turned. That's you. I can recognize your calf muscles. That's got to be you. He's always convinced that I'm whatever. And, and he um, he said, always keep a journal. Always keep a diary because one day someone's going to want to read your book. And I'm like, Dad, and this is 1996. I'm like, Dad, why would anyone want to read my book? The Cold War's over. There's not going to be another war, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so I did always keep journals. And my dad always knew that I was the one that invaded Iraq alone and all that stuff. <laughs> um, but I kept the journal and, and I finally got to a point where I, I, I you know, this is a good story. I, I do have some memories of all this stuff. And um, then I wrote it down and then, and then I, I, I got some help with my publisher and, and uh, you know, you write down your things and then the editors take it over and, yeah. you know, they, they, they dot your T's and cross your I's and all that stuff. And, but, but, you know, we got a good story and, and uh, I had a great team, but they, you know, we were able to get it done and knock it out. And you can tell that a lot of it's written by me because there's some sailor language and I, Let's go off on tangents like my bar shipmates. Yeah. I had this thing with political correctness. You know, the, my favorite word in the Navy was shit. It was what? Uh, my, I have a thing with political correctness, okay. and my favorite word in the, in the Navy was shipmate. Okay. Because, like, shit, shipmate was a term of endearment. Like, hey, shipmate, you know, tighten up the whatever. Or, hey, shipmate. And they always say that word. So, uh, But in, in, in boot camp, they call you shipmate. They're, like, yelling at you. And I loved it. And even as a Navy SEAL senior chief, I would call sailor shipmate because I, I love it. But then the Navy took it out because of political correctness, because it's, it's degrading. So they started calling him Sea Warrior, which I think is ridiculous. <laughs> I did sea not know Warrior, that. Sea but but I, I, I mentioned the book and I'm going to do this. I don't know if it's in Butte, Montana or Nashville or something. But I'm going to open a bar called Shipmates. And the rule is all my employees, including bouncers, need to ev finish every sentence with the word shipmate to the, employee, oh, to the uh, guest. 
So even when they kick someone out, it's like, get the fuck out of shit mates. Shit. Shit mates. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a lofty goal. And I believe... And I, <laughs> <laughs> and, but you know what? I bet that that place will be packed every night. I hope so. I hope so. Every he, likes, he likes to dream big. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> But we all got to have dreams and plans, and that's a good one to have, as good as any, right? You don't want to. So, and in terms of all that stuff, too, I mean, not only telling your story, it's important. And you happen to be a central figure in several important stories and historic events. And there's really no way around around that, right? Like how you, whether you fell well, into you, know, the you couldn't swim and you wound well, I mean, up doing all this. You know, you know, um, other serv- services mess with other services. There's always jokes about the Air Force, jokes yeah. about the Navy. Few of us joke about the Marine Corps because we don't want to have our asses handed to us. <laughs> but we all, we, you know, we, we just all joke with each other. But some of my Army buddies told me a funny story about, I'm a big believer that it's positive attitude, right place, right time, and a little yeah. bit of luck. You get there. But I happen to be on some of these big missions, and I had a, a Green Beret buddy of mine say, you know, you're kind of like the Forrest Gump of uh, the Navy, only you're not as good looking and you can't run very well. <laughs> <laughs> well that, hey, was that, was that was a compliment. Thank is, you. Is that a compliment? That is a compliment. I think it's a compliment. Yeah. But yeah, so, you know, I mean, that's the that's the bottom line is that it, it was going to be somebody. And in many of these instances, it was you or you were a key player. And it's an important story. And like you said, these stories need to be preserved and they need to be told and they need to be. I think it is, yeah. And it, was, it wasn't me. It was, it was a huge team of people working over yeah. the course of decades to find him. I happened to be the, the guy that was smart enough to carry a gun and a sledgehammer and turn a corner because of the guy in front of me went somewhere else. You know, okay. if you back up to that, it was the other teammates that got us to that position on the third floor, the pilots yeah. that delivered us there, the air crew guys that opened the doors that we couldn't have figured out, the, the group of women and all the analysts, at CIA, sorry, the uh, other government agencies, the three other agencies that found us. <laughs> Uh, so much uh, Admiral McCraven, who was in charge of a certain team that coordinated for us to be the people that went there and, and the rotations of why it was our team that was picked. And it's, yeah, I mean, it all, you know, it's a butterfly effect. It all comes down to one thing. But the bottom line is, I had a brave guy go straight and I turned right. Yeah. And, and, then I, I saw it, and that's yeah. ridiculous. I happen, I'm lucky to know a lot of awesome people in my world. One of them is a Medal of Honor recipient, uh, John Baca from. Vietnam and he threw himself he threw his helmet on a grenade and then threw himself on top of the helmet um and he saved people's lives and he was severely injured from it but uh that level of just selflessness and just courage is ridiculous I don't know how many people would be able to do that and in your book and in all your interviews I've seen you're always very clear and very sure to point out that there were so many other people involved and and all that. So well, I mean, every time I, there was. Every time. Uh, um, yeah. even, even the people that jump on the grenades, um, yeah. they're not doing it for the greater good or for the Republican Party, the Democrat Party. They're doing it for the people next right. to them. Yeah. That's it. It comes down to that. It's, it's very mac, mac, micro that goes to the macro. And it's yeah. the, the, the Marines that fought for Fallujah, they, they're not fighting for Fallujah so that we can eventually lead the war. They're fighting for the Marine next to them going house to house. Right. And that's what it comes down to. We were talking earlier about how they'd go to the ready room for a beer. I got a chance right when he got stationed at Virginia Beach. Oh my gosh! To, to go out, we went to, uh, to the ready room, and you know we, we, this was before uh, I think I, I don't remember the exact date, but it, it was one. Of, it was very early in his Navy career, and uh, a good friend of ours. You know, it was the first time I met him, and he pulled me aside. And he said, "Now you're you're uh, you're Rob's older brother," and I, I said, "Yeah." He says, I, "I can imagine that you're kind of worried about the things that are going to possibly be happening." So, I said, I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean, he's, 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 he made, you know, he's, he's on SEAL 10 year on team two at that time. And he said, I want you to come over here. I want you to look around this room. I looked around and it was a bunch of very, you know, great guys. He says, uh, you have one brother. He now has 30 brothers. And he just, he said, we're going to take care of him. We're not going to let bad things happen to him. And we've got his back. He's got ours. That really, that that stayed with me. uh, It was really, uh, Good thing at the time. They seem very noble at the time. It turns out they were just shit faced. Hammer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that happens to everybody, right? Um, but no, that and that is something, and I know that that's also something that's difficult when people leave the military to to lose that. And 
I thought that was super interesting that you noted in your book that out of all the stuff you've done, that one of the you know most difficult and you know nerve wracking things you did was decide to leave the Navy when you left the Navy. That was not an easy decision for you at the time. Well, it was it was a point where I was only going to be in the Navy when I joined for four to six years. Yeah. And not make it through SEAL training, but I made it through SEAL training. Then uh, when it was time to get out, I met the guys. and like, well, I can't leave now. I re-enlisted. Then 9-11 happened. Okay, four, six more years. Then I heard about SEAL Team 6. Got to stay, stay, stay. And I saw, you know, I got, I was on the Lone Survivor Rescue. I was on the Cat and Rescue on the Bin Laden Raid. Yeah. I was on the base when Bo Virgo walked off, all this stuff. And that's when it turned into, okay, I'm going to stay now for 30 years. And I'm going to, I'm going to, um, retire in Coronado as an instructor, 30 years in the Navy, and I was going to live there forever. And then the Bin Laden raid went down with all the other stuff, and then Extortion 17 was shot down in August 6, 2011. We lost 31 Americans. And then it's like, okay, now it's time to get out. So the, the, nothing ever wor- nothing ever works out the way it's supposed to. The, the, when you're planning for everything, you know, life is what happens around you as yeah. you're planning for this. It's just you, you never – you, of all people, know. So um, it's just one meal at a time. It doesn't matter how we got here. We're here. Let's deal yeah. with it. Yeah. I love that. Bing. What the, somebody's like chicken. That sounds fun. I, I've been yelling for the, <laughs> turn, turn it off. I don't know why he's listening. Dinner's done. Okay. So. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a professional <laughs> DJ, so he's deaf in both eyes. <laughs> I just found out I got, I got hair for, uh, for radio as well. So. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Right. All right. So another thing you have, and in between all this, you know, there's – also more important stuff. Another message that I, I love that you, you hammer home in your book in different ways. And I think really is something that we like to kind of bring out to our audience too. You keep saying complacency kills and, and there's mm-hmm. such an overlap, you know, not just in the military, but I think that's so applicable to all of life. But can you talk a little bit about that and what you mean when you say that? The, uh, one of the biggest problems I've seen in the private sector is regardless of how it's going, people have a tendency to say, do it because I said so. And this is the way we've always done it. And that's, that's a recipe for failure because yeah. complacency is not caused by failure. Learning is a result of failure. Complacency is caused by success. And if you have too much success, you're going to get complacent because, well, you know, it's always worked before. We're winning now. We've always done it this way. We'll be fine when the opponent is trying to be better than you. Um, um, the example of, of, of failure as a learning uh, learning tool is what did Michael Jordan say? In my career, I've missed more than 3,000 shots. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I was asked to take the game-winning shot, and I missed. I've failed over and over and over again, and that's why I succeed. Because yeah. you learn from failure. You, you, you learn from failure and get defeated because of success. Um, very rarely do uh, – um, some of the successful has failed 300 times and succeeded once. Someone really good, a CEO. There's never been. I mean, uh, granted, there are the, uh, the, the in, you know, in college, the trust fund babies that were born on third, thinking they hit a triple. Not the case. Yeah. The, the, the people, the people that get to a certain level, you need too much. Yes. <laughs> He's got every mobile device on the planet over here dinging. Because apparently, I tweeted that out. Grandma saw it. Now she's Facebooking <laughs> the shit out of my brother. <laughs> Are you serious? Well, she's like my hair either. Yeah, she <laughs> she hates your hair too. <laughs> um, yeah, awesome. I mean, it, it, hi, Grandma. It's I, it's one of those things that's like called resting on your laurels. Resting on your laurels. Now that's something my grandpa said. Well, yeah, and it's one resting of, well, on your laurels. Take, take for example, right now, uh, uh, Tom Brady, <laughs> who's won five Super Bowls, could easily say that's enough. But guess what? He's going for a six right now. Yeah, and, and everybody freaking hates him. One of the best games he ever played was, was a few days ago, you know, when he beat the crap out of people. And he's going to continue to do it. I hope he wins a six. That's awesome. I don't because know he's if, not complacent. I don't know anything about football, but that one Super Bowl, uh, two Super Bowls, I remember. One, I literally went into labor at kickoff. Like, water went poop everywhere, and that was it. That was the end of the Super Bowl for us. So I remember that one. And the other one. <laughs> the good excuse. <laughs> That'll work. And the other one I remember was when the Patriots made that – crazy comeback in the second half yeah, and, they, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and everybody i remember everybody sitting around saying oh my god it's over i can't believe patriots gonna lose they could never you know, get they can never come back from this look at the gap and i'm like 
they need exactly as much points as the other team scored in the first half of the game. So like that team scored it in the first half. Why can't Patriots do the same exact thing in the second half? It was just crazy to me. And they made that crazy well, comeback, when, when which has nothing to do with what we're talking about. But what? They, they lost in a seven. Right? No, I know. Tom's a Bears fan. God bless him. And uh, no, I, you were talking about the Chargers. I remember in 07, we watched the Bears Super Bowl. Why did you make the sign of the I, I I brought it because we're talking about something similar. He did. The Bears he did that. Yeah, I did it. The Bears started doing bad. That's when Tom picked me in the water. <laughs> <laughs> but then the Redskins beat the Bears the next two years. <laughs> Irish Catholic family. I'm going to take your word for that. I'm a Catholic family too. Eight years of Catholic school. Yeah, I feel like yeah, yeah. Um, I should get some what, sort of badge for that, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. almost enough to where you lose the faith. I don't know. Yeah, almost lose <laughs> the faith. It's like, yeah, I was oh a Catholic until I age of reason. <laughs> yes, I could go on forever Sorry. about that. But and my mom's watching. At Sorry, some mom. point, my mom's going to watch too. I know, so I don't want to go into it. But uh, yes. No, let's say it. <laughs> a different, a different <laughs> the, the phone starts digging again. <laughs> hey, hey, Tom, it's Satan. <laughs> it's Satan. We'll take you out for a Satan. pizza and cookies. Yeah, and talk about <laughs> Racquetball. All right. Yeah, yes, I like that. <laughs> So there are a lot of uh, missions that you were on that are very well known and that you saw through from beginning to end personally. What is it like? I don't know if I knew this about you, that you were there trying to help rescue Marcus Luttrell. And then, I mean, I was reading what you went through, like donkeys jumping off a cliff and crap because it was so hot. That's actually so <laughs> dropping so down. I'm like, oh, my God. And then you go through all that and you're told, all right, somebody else got him. He's good. Go home, guys. Well, but. that was okay because we were going after him for about two and a half or three days, and, and we yeah. actually brought an entire corporation full of every our, every force of their armed services. And it didn't matter at that point who who gets him. We didn't know. Just someone yeah. get him. We got to find him. It, the the Korangal Valley, Sharia Valley is in Kona Province, eastern Afghanistan. It's pretty much the most dangerous place in the world. And if this guy's living there somehow and he's still alive, we owe it to him and his parents to go get him. We got to find him. Yeah. And um, it, it was a relief. It was a relief to us when the, I believe it was a team of rangers that flew in and finally got him because we were all over the entire mountain and, and none of the bad guys were going anywhere. But when he was finally um, finally grabbed, it was a, it was a relief because okay, he, they got him. We can stop him now. But then it's like, oh crap, we're on top of this mountain now. We got to get out. Yeah. So what happened then? Yeah. Like that was, I was like, what, what happened? What'd they do? How'd they go back? The more donkeys died? Walk, like, what? Back down, walk back down to where you think that you park the donkeys and ride them out. I mean, <laughs> and we've always said that. Yeah, Being from Montana, it was a mule, but whatever. It was a mule. Yeah. So, and there's no, I mean, there's just relief that, that he was rescued and it's not like, you don't feel yeah, like you were there for no reason. Like, no, no, it's, it's again, one of those things where, um, as long as you don't care who gets the credit and want the mission to succeed, you're going to be a good yeah. team. Yeah. And that's all it was. I mean, someone else got him, but we got him and he's safe and his family's good. And then, and we, you know, we were able to recover the bodies, uh, the, 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 the brave guys that, that died. Wow. And, um, it, I mean, it, it was a, a failure of a mission followed by a success. We finally, and, and hopefully we learned from it. You know, we all yeah. learn from <clears throat> the standard operating procedures for what we do next time. Something like this comes up. It's, it wasn't a great day. It was a horrible, no, horrible, yeah. But we, you know, we got Marcus out. We got we got the the, the remains out, and, and uh, so that was you hell. guys. That was you guys that went and got the rest of his team. Yeah, it wasn't me. It wasn't me, but it was part of part of part of, part of my squad, and part of my team. And yeah, it was a yeah. Big, it's a big place. It's a big, steep, scary place. Yeah, I bet. And you know, joking aside, you guys have really been through it, and h how you have to sort of kind of process all those experiences that you've been through and still get up and do it again the next day when it's continuing to happen all around you and then come back to a world, right? Like, so even my husband was killed over there, right? But that doesn't mean I understand what you all went through. It doesn't, like, I know what I went through, but I don't know what you all, but, you know, I can't even imagine what it's like to have to be in that environment all the time and doing what you what you got to do well i mean it's a lot of it is 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 uh teammates and friends family and then the compartmentalization of of i have to be yeah. like this in a certain spot and i'm going to be like this in a certain spot and and it it, it can't be it's it's a lot of people say stuff like all in all the time which is great 
but I don't think it is all the time. I mean, like sometimes you, you need to take a wrap off. Sometimes real, the realization that I don't need to necessarily be up in the gym this early in the morning. I, I can sleep in if I want. Yeah. Um, I can take yeah. a day off. I can chill out a little bit. And, and I always tell people if you want to be fast, slow down a little bit. Don't, don't, don't think you need to solve everything at once. Uh, be quick enough to, 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 to realize what's important and then take out the first thing. Knock out the first thing and then the second thing. is like, Again, I, I tell my, my kids, you know, how, how do you uh, eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You'll get there. What if one of your kids came to you down the road and said, hey, Dad, I'm going to join the military. How would you feel about that? I would, say, cool. I would say, cool, start getting straight A's right now. Get accepted to one of the academies and learn how to fly something. Yeah, that's the way to go? That's it. I would support them anything they want to do, anything at all. I, if, they wanted, if one of them wanted to be a Navy SEAL, I'm like, fine. I fill the bathtub full of ice water, jump in there for 20 hours. We'll see how you feel after that. <laughs> so basically, you what say yes, and then you scare the shit out of them. <laughs> what are you, secrets? Well, yeah, that one's inappropriate. Yeah, but that one was too bad for even the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we would have broken, broken the internet on that horrible show. <laughs> All right, fine. That's the way you want to be. I'll just start whispering over here, too. Okay, so we have... Uh, <laughs> We have a couple of little questions. I'm getting these notes. We're very high tech here. We write them down on our fancy notebook. Hey, that's the best way to do it. Um, so David Bennett would like to know, who is Mark Owens? Um, I never worked with a guy named what? Mark Owens. Oh, hang on. What's he? All right. Well, he never worked with a guy named Mark Owens. That's the question I got. So David Bennett, he doesn't know. That's the name it says, Dave? Never. Mark Owens? That's the name it says, Dave Mark Owens? Okay. So he never heard of Mark Owens. He's really a singer of Alabama, isn't he? <laughs> a singer in Alabama. Okay. So right. no, 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 no. Not, not in Alabama. Oh, of Alabama. Alabama. Of Alabama. Play me some mountain music. I love Sorry. that band. My grandma and grandpa used to play. <laughs> yes, we harmonize. Oh, my God. Is, your wife, <laughs> is she left home alone with you two? Yeah, she's over there laughing at me. She's Did literally with her divorce attorney. <laughs> <laughs> she's not laughing. <laughs> no, she's laughing. He's not. She's over there counting something. He's taking notes a lot like yours. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, look, I think I'm like an hour away from you. She could just come hang here and leave you to Yahoo. <laughs> All right. So right now, uh, here's another question. Were you involved in Operation Just Cause? Just Cause? Wasn't Just Cause was, was, was 1989. I don't know. I, I know less about that than football. I think just that's the question. I'm looking this up. All right. Uh, so they, so the answer would be no. <laughs> no, but I heard Mark Owen was. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, that okay. was Panama in 1989. I was in seventh grade. Okay. And he well, kicked we, ass. We heard and you. My wife right? was born. My my wife was born in eighty nine. All right. Well, we heard you were very precocious, so we thought that maybe there was a chance. All right. So. That's pretty funny. You're um <laughs> thank you. So you're involved in now, I mean, on top of speaking and you know, and your book and all that, you you work to support nonprofits that support veterans. Do you want to talk take a minute? Yeah, I'm a founder you of yourgratefulnation.org. I started that um when I got out of the Navy right around 2013, 2014 for okay. special operators that need to transition to the private sector because they don't realize that once you leave the military, like a lot of like an old guy graduates at, or sorry, uh, retires at 45. Yeah. You got another 45 years of left of life and you need to, to pay the mortgage. And, and a lot of the yeah. people, men and women both don't realize that they have skills that, that can transition to the private sector. So your grateful nation helps them find that, find out where they want to live, what industry they want to be a part of and um, how to get the conversation started. We do a, Transition period, a, a mentorship, and then they get hired for like major management products in those industries. So uh, I learned that the hard way because I was one of the guys with the chip on my shoulder. Well, I did this and that, so I'm going to get out. And when do I start? And how much you paying me type stuff? But uh, it's not the case. So yourgratefulnation.org transitions a lot of veterans to the private sector. That's, I, that's one of the major things I'm doing. All right. So say I'm a special op guy because I, I look yes. like I could be one, right? So Absolutely. I just got, you know, I'm out a week ago. I'm out. And now I'm looking to start a new life, start a new career. And I find your organization. What are the first things I can do to actually get started? Is there like an application go, process? Go to, 
go to yeah, go to www. Your dot Right. And uh, there's there's a request there to get in touch with the um, with the operations uh, the, the people that run the operations there. Which we actually hired a um, uh, retired Green Bay Colonel Rob Carilla because I learned along the way that. You know, I may be able to kick a door down, but there are people out there smarter than I that can run an organization. So Colonel Carrillo runs that, um, gets in the information. They, they do the interviews. They, uh, they they talk to them. And then, again, it's find out what's your family, where you want to live, what you want to do, and how do we get the process started. And they do it. And we're, we're, I think we, we're trying to just quite a few people. We're doing – we're growing now, too. It's I, I, I learned um, along with how much I need to pay in taxes for my fair share, how, also how expensive it is to run a nonprofit. Yep. But um, we're getting there. Yep. We're doing a great job, and it's um, your great foundation is doing a really, really good thing. Awesome. So, how do you? I mean, can people donate to that directly, or do you have events oh, yeah. that it's, raise it's, money it's, for it? It's all there. It's all there on the website, yourgratefulnation.org. and everything from a donation to awareness. To tell your friends. Uh, just check it out, and it's it's the majority of our money. You know, we obviously, you need, need to pay a staff, but the majority of the money goes towards the veterans transitioning. And the the, the best part of uh, the best part of my week is when I get an email from the vet, from the spouse that just says, um, now we're able to start our second career. It wasn't possible without this foundation. And I think we're one of the few out there doing that specific one. So it's, it's very rewarding. That is great. Cause I know uh, I spent a couple of years also working professionally as a veteran specialist. And I, so I got to know directly from people coming out of the military, that struggle and um, experiencing it on my other side, you know, as the surviving spouse, when you lose your, spouse and you got kids to take care of and then you got to restart your career or take yeah, a break yeah. off and restart it and it's a problem man it's a problem so uh, anything it's a problem anybody, people don't realize too because yeah. once you get out of the limelight people kind of i mean not no fault of theirs but they kind of just forget forget about you and you think one, one, I mean, one of my favorite sayings yeah. is the problem with never forget is people keep forgetting to never forget People keep forgetting. To, okay, gotcha. Yes. It is deep. <laughs> That's like a yeah. triple negative. That was deep. That was deep. That was like a, a deep. I, yeah, I'm a professional. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's hard. And it's crazy to think. So people might think like, oh, he's Rob O'Neill. He's this famous seal. He gets out of the military. He's going to have no problem finding work. Everybody's going to want to hire him. Everybody's going to want to work with him. And that wasn't the case. No. Necessarily. No, not at all. I mean, yeah. the, the first few jobs I had, I was uh, I was an advisor to a, a, a microsystem company out of out of uh, uh, Mississippi. Uh, I was I was working for a, a boutique lobbying firm on Capitol Hill, um, and and it's the same thing. You know, you gotta you gotta kind of get out there, make connections, do some networking. I was actually part of LinkedIn, which I don't need more just because. Uh, you got too cool for LinkedIn. Yeah. No, that's what I'm saying. I, I dig it, but everyone else was, "Hey, I knew a guy that knew a guy. Can you just hook me up with this thing?" It's like. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, but um, um, yeah, but but but, but the, the, you know, there, there are things out there I didn't realize that veterans are qualified for what they can do, and, and yeah. um, as long as if, if, if there's a better bridge there for a lot of the vets, and especially you know, the families of vets, then we're going to do it. And you know, we've linked up with like uh, Folds of Honor for 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 um, Children of the Fallen, where they give scholarships to the yeah. to the kids, which is great. And we're all trying to work hand in glove to to, to help the veterans, help the families. And I think it's very important. But I mean, even like, even right now, you know, people are so concerned about the democratic retreat in in Puerto Rico, but no one's thinking about there are men and women still in Iraq right now in Helmand Province. Yeah, um, we need to remember yeah. the veterans, the the, the, the people, as they call the war fighters. Yeah, and they're going to need jobs when they get out too. So it's not ending. It's not ending soon or anytime soon. Sadly, there's a a lot of people come out and just kind of crash. Um, all right, Martin Hart Jr. wants me to ask you. <laughs> Are you still in contact with the operator who peed on your frozen hands? <laughs> yes, actually, I am. I kind of wanted to know that too. I was curious about that too. Yeah, that was yeah. Just... He's in the guest. He's in the guest bathroom, toweling <laughs> off. Oh my lord! <laughs> All right. I, so I, yeah, you have it. Thank you very much because he obviously. Did. <laughs> it's not every day that someone pees in your hand, or is it? Depends on the day. <laughs> it depends on the person. Because of the person. Barbara Lloyd Parker says her dad was lost after the Navy. I don't know if she means after service, but I'm sorry to hear that. I know that it's a, it, it is like kidding aside. There is that like gap that you fall through when you're in the service and you come out and family members. I think she's been lost, think she'd been lost after like the Navy's over now. What? 
I think that's, I, I'm assuming that's Okay, yeah, yeah, all right. A lot I, of veterans I, have, have that. Yes, probably. See, have I, those I, issues with it. I, my mind goes right away. Somebody says loss. I'm like, oh, they died. Like this. Well, I mean, I know, <laughs> I know a lot of sailors. Like, <laughs> I know a lot of sailors that, that okay. were lost in the navy. Yes. We got back on the ship, left Thailand, and everyone was fine. <laughs> All <laughs> right. Um, please tell Rob Tom is going to crush him and Miss Pac-Man. Yes. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Hello. What, yeah. What I'm talking we about. <laughs> We have had an ongoing Miss Pac-Man bet for the better part of, since like 82. About 82, yeah. About 82, yeah. yeah. And he, he always beats me, but we're, we're getting to it. My, my wife actually bought me for Christmas this year the no kidding arcade stand up version of Miss Pac-Man so I could practice. See, I had the advantage while he was out in, in all, all the different continents chasing ISIS and Al Qaeda. I was just busy chasing Inky, Blinky, Pinky, and Clyde. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the real hero? Who's the real hero? That was just that. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm afraid to do this and bring it down for a little bit, but I do have to um, actually ask you about the Bin Laden. Yeah. So, um, and I know, I mean, I've heard you tell this story a lot of times. First, it's a hard, I mean, what does it do to have to keep telling this story over and over? Do you get like story fatigue of telling it or does it, do you feel no, like... No, I, I, it, um, no, I, I think the story needs to be told. If people want to hear about it, they should hear about it. It's, it's American history. And it's not my story. It's, I well, just I know what happened. Right. So it's your story, and it's everyone else's story who was there. And it's America's story, too. Um, but you're the one. Not who keeps being, the, uh, uh, people from over 80 countries were killed in both towers. Yeah. So it's it's the world's story. Um, and it wasn't a it wasn't a war on Lower Manhattan. It wasn't a war in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, or or right. the Pentagon. This was a war against Western. This is the this is the war against modern society. And if um, if people want to hear the story, they should hear the story. And that's that. I mean, it, again, it wasn't me. If, if it, believe me, right. if 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 it was me jumping through the sky like killing Bin Laden alone, my book would be like that long. <laughs> right, probably. And um, well, I won't say it, but yeah. So. <laughs> You're there. I mean, all that secrecy, you didn't even know until a couple of weeks. Yeah, about three weeks. Of, of where you're going. And there was already, it created some kind of dissent, even among all you guys who were so tight about the people who weren't going with you. And then those of you. Yeah, that, well, that was people. awkward because at first they pulled a, a small group of us into a room. Yeah. And we were a small group inside of a we were a smaller group inside of a small group. And when we would come out of these long meetings, the guys that weren't involved would say, Hey, what are you guys doing? What's going on? And not only could we not tell them, but we didn't even know to tell them. So they right. assumed we're hiding something from them. And it just, it, it did get awkward. It was, it was a big split, but the reason for the secrecy was, was simply because if one person tells anyone that leaks to someone, mm -hmm. this is the only chance we have. And if anything gets over there, well, like the first day when, when they actually told us what we were doing, they're like, well, we have these options, this, this. We can do a unilateral or sorry, a multilateral operation with the Pakistani military. I'm like, yeah, super. Tell the Pakistanis that we found Bin Laden. I'm, I'm sure he'll be there. Yeah. Yeah. But we, I mean, it was, it, was the, it was the point where when we were flying our legs to get over there, stopping in Germany, stopping in Wagner Airfield down in Jalalabad, there were senior ranking officers trying to get on our plane just to find out, we had to kick them off. Wow! No, no one's allowed to know what we're doing. It was, yeah. it was, it was, it was tied up for a reason, and, and uh, it, it, you know, it paid off. But I mean, what do they say? Loose lips sink ships, and yeah. someone's going to tell someone to tell someone. And especially even back then, social media wasn't that big. But someone leaks this out, Bin Laden finds out, he's out of there. Yeah, totally gone. It's astounding. I mean, it's amazing to me to think of everything that had to happen for him not to know that you guys were on your way to come get him. I mean, well, especially considering the uh, Pakistani intelligence forces were hiding him. So, and they pretty much know everything that we do. That is wild. So we, that is like yeah. just wild. And you went on that trip. I don't, I, it's hard for me to talk about the parts where you're like kissing your kids goodbye and saying goodbye and all that. So unless you want to see like a, a widow cry here, we're, we're going to skip over that part. No, we can, but, we can, we can. But you're, um, you know, you're doing that and that's your mindset. And, that's crazy. Just, just a whole other thing. I don't think people who haven't experienced that can ever fully. But that, I mean, that, that's the reason they, they picked the most experienced senior guys to go on the mission because we've been we've been through it so many times. It wasn't going to be a big shock to us, and we were almost numb to the the, the 
what the possibilities are, and we accepted it with a lot more ease than someone that was new to the. So yeah, they, but they even they just, the, you're just saying that like that. Face. All right. Well, whatever. I'm not going to like dive into that. I just think it's incredible that you all are able to function and people, like you said, are there right now with that same mindset and that willingness. And I think it's just, just, right now, yeah. yeah, that we just need to keep in mind every day. I'm like, that's part of why we started this too. I'm like so many people I've given so much so that we can all sit here in this country and, you know, talk, talk to each other. Well, like, no, I mean, you know, it's too far with those, not even just sit here and talk, talk the history, talk recent history, but also laugh once in a while because yeah. You're going to need to keep some things light because what's one of my favorite sayings, uh, don't be afraid to laugh every day because none of us are getting out of this alive. Yeah. Yeah. And oh my God, you think SEALs have sick jokes. Hang out with a bunch of military widows. and <laughs> 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 I dare you. It's a whole other experience. <laughs> but okay. So there you are. And you all are, have seemed to have accepted the fact that there's more odds than anything else that none of you are coming out of this alive and i mean you just go anyway because you know all the other people that you're going to be impacting and making a difference in their lives and preserving our way of life by doing that uh, so what is that so you're going in and you have all that craziness that helicopter goes down you don't even know it and you're in the house how is your at that point is the adrenaline just going so much or you're so yeah, locked down no, there, there, there wasn't there wasn't adrenaline at all because we'd already accepted it. We'd already, we've done this hundreds of times before. Yeah. I, I just remember being in the, in the back of the line, watching guys work, knowing imminent death was there, but thinking how they didn't care. And it was just, they were just cool. And I remember thinking these guys are so cool. And basically that's later reflecting on that is like, I was just a guy watching cool guys do cool stuff. And occasionally I would turn a corner and do something cool. And that's all it was. These guys were just incredible to watch. Incredible. The, 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 the hardest working, the most mechanical, the most methodical, most technical. And they just knew how to do it. They didn't, uh, they didn't let the, the realization of things that they worry about don't matter. So why worry about it? Were these guys, um, I, I don't know if I sorted this out in this book. These guys, you were all pulled from different like, teams or different areas. We, like, no, we, we were. We were we were part of the same bigger team, but, okay. but we would break everything down. We had the rule of threes. Okay. So each, you know, each group had a group of three that we called you no know, troop. And then each troop was broken into three teams and we'd keep it simple because we had an acronym KISS, keep it simple, stupid. Because I'm stupid, I can't remember, so I'll keep it simple. So we, from one, one of the larger groups, they pulled the most experienced guys out. Um, and it happened to be the right rotation they sent those guys on. All right. So, but I mean, did you know, did you all know anyway, each other? That, every one of them. I've been, working, I've been working with every one of them for years. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. I was wondering that, like how you could just step in and work so well together if you hadn't known and worked with each other for years. You have to, I mean, literally trust each other with your lives in that situation. So, all right. Talk us through then. You're walking into that house and shit gets real. Well, yeah. And again, real. just the guys are in front of me. They're just doing their thing. And yeah. um, I found out the helicopter crashed outside. I didn't realize it. Uh, we went to the stairs. There was a set of stairs where the, 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 the three letter agency people told us that uh, Khalid bin Laden would be on the stairs. We, he was there. He was armed, like I said. And he was engaged by the, the first few guys. I was about eight guys back. We went to the second floor. Um, the guys in front of me split off. I had one guy in front of me, and then we knew we were going to the top floor. And we had already killed, I think, four terrorists, and we knew that bin Laden had to be up there. And the guy in front of me looking at the stairs through a curtain said, you know, he. He, he convinced me through a number of words that we need to get through there because they're obviously putting on the suicide vest now and we can beat him. We can win. And um, my job was to squeeze him on the shoulder, but I wanted more guys behind me. We didn't have him. I was like, all right, let's just do this. And I just remember thinking, let's just get it over with. We're going to get blown up now. And I'm, I'm tired of thinking about it. Let's go. So we went up and he moved the curtain, jumped on people that he thought were uh, suicide bombers. And because of the tactics, he moved this way. I had to move that way. And when I turned that way, Bin Laden was standing there and he was about, Four inches taller than me. I saw him. He was a threat. He, I recognized him. I recognized his nose. He was skinnier, older, gray hair. And um, he wasn't surrendering. And I, I assumed he was a suicide bomber, so I had to shoot him. So I shot him twice in the face. And then he fell down. I shot him again. And then moved his wife out of the way because she was in front of him. Um, saw his son, his young son. And I remember feeling bad because this kid's got nothing to do with this fight. 
picked him up, put him next to his mom, and then other Navy SEALs are coming in the room, and, and uh, I kind of looked at them, and, and one of the guys came over to me, and he, I was, that's when it hit me, and I kind of froze, and I said, uh, he goes, are you good? And I said, uh, no, what do we do now? And he said, now we find the computer. Find all the computers, find the intel. We do this every night. And I was like, yeah, you're right, I'm back. Holy shit. And he said, yeah, um, you just killed Bin Laden, man. That is just wild. And so, I mean, it didn't really sink into you, the enormity of it? I think it because might have by now, uh, so yeah, many years by later. Now, but no. yes. <laughs> by now, yes. By now. that moment. And even then, when you're No, because when, when, my buddy, when my buddy said, you just killed Bin Laden, then he kind of said, he goes, your life just changed. Now let's get, let's get to work. And so we did. We went and yeah. found the computers, and we got different helicopters, and we, we flew out. And then coming back from that then, so now you're back. And I remember, I mean, there were celebrations throughout the country. It was, it was wild. It was intense. And it, there was some disbelief. There was like, no, that's not really him. And they can't, you know, all those. Oh, there's still that now, too. No one, so a lot of people don't believe it's him. They there's conspiracy that. theories. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're they're the flat earthers, too, right? Um, but, totally. Never land on the moon. Yeah. So, and then you come home and you have kind of different relationships with people in the military. There's, did, did it kind of shift for you, the feeling and the vibe that you're Yeah, getting? well, yeah, the whole thing shifted because I was going to retire and now there's a little bit of negativity because, yeah. especially at that level, when people are so close to doing something like that and they don't, they have a tendency to get a little bit jealous. And I've seen I've seen it before on other missions, but this was the biggest one ever. And regardless of how tight lipped we were supposed to be, no one's going to keep this one a secret yeah, because yeah. every single person in every single military branch, as soon as they found out Bin Laden was dead, was the first question they asked: "Who got him?" Yeah, yeah. And my name before I even landed back in the states, my name was from East Coast to West Coast. And that was sort of out of your hands. I mean, there was just no stopping that. It is very difficult to get yeah. the shaving cream back in the can. Yeah, <laughs> it's like yeah. It's out. So now, and I mean, so how is it to think like your kids may actually read your name in a history book, your grandkids? Oh, they, they've read it. They've read it. Trust me. Yeah. There's a good story about one of my kids. And I told them they're not allowed to talk about it. And we have a lot of security in place, a lot of different stuff that we've done. I don't want to get into it. But yeah. the one year anniversary of Bin Laden's death, we, I had my, my kids at a water park. In Williamsburg, Virginia, and we're getting ready to get dressed, and we're putting on our suits, and we're going to go swimming. And we had the news on, and I remember the anchor on TV, and I was still in the Navy. They said, um, all right, this is the year anniversary of bin Laden's death, so right now we're going to take viewer email. The best story of where you were when you found out bin Laden was dead, send it to us, and we'll put it on the air. And my daughter looks up and goes, oh, my God, Dad, you've got to email them and tell them you were in his bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> How old was she when that happened? On that uh, she, she was like seven. Oh my gosh, that's genius! Mm -hmm. And yeah, how hard is it for them not to be like, "My dad did this," you know? They 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 they, knew, they mentioned it to me before when they go to school and people talked about it and like I really just want to raise my hand, but I can't do it. Wow, and they don't. They do, know, it. I mean, so, do they have well, friends they, they that know, don't know, like or classmates that may not know who their dad is? Yeah, because well, yeah, like I said, there's security seven place. Yeah. No one knows who they are. And I mean, Wow, that's a but whole they are, other they level. Are, a few of them are funny. They're like, you know, you realize if we say who we are, we can totally get a reality show on MTV. <laughs> <laughs> so, are they teenagers now? How old? You know what? I don't want to get. I don't want to. Oh talk yeah. About okay. Okay. I was gonna say. Well, good luck then with that. Like when they hit their teen years. <laughs> yeah, old. assuming they were. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that. I mean, to, just to even think about that. And if people understand that level, like that's something that never leaves, right? That impacts your whole family, like their whole dynamics, the whole relationship. What do you, what do you, what do you think? Yeah. yeah, they can't just like show pictures of their family. They can't like have friends over to their house or anything. I mean, that's that takes it to another level with that, oh, what yeah. that does. And that lasts, that lasts forever. Yeah, that is a forever, a forever thing. That is crazy. I know, um, also get to be friends with this guy. I don't know if you heard of Hamidi Jassim. He, uh, he is an Iraqi born, uh, now American citizen. And, you know, he was in Saddam's prison when he was 11 year old. He became one of our greatest intelligence assets over there. He has a yeah, wild, yeah. And he had a, like, 
leave his family and go into hiding. And I was like, so all the things that families go through as well, just for the well-being of our country and for like me sitting here. Well, it's, today, it, you know, it's, like, it stops being interesting to normal people. So people forget about it, except for the actual families. And certainly yeah. the government's not going not to help us at, at all because there's no more interest in them helping us. So it turns into a very personal thing that you need to, you need to defend your entire family. Yeah. And it's like you get the, you know, the families get the what have you done for me lately kind of attitude, you know, um, and it's bad. There are some people, you know, in my world, the widow world, uh, and you get stuck and you think like, well, my husband died for this country. So what do you mean you don't care about that story? And the truth is they don't. There's just too many other stories and too many other people out there serving and that's, them. That's part of and, but the sooner, I think the sooner that you get that reality through your head, the better chance you have of putting your life back together in a timely fashion. I think that it's people that kind of hang on to the, to the whole like, well, this is what we went through. This is what we lost. So now everybody should care. And people, not that they don't care, like they're different, but it just, they just move on. So. You got to move on with them. All right. We'll ask the last couple of questions. We'll let you, let you kids get back to your wife. I'm sure can't wait to have you back. We, 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 are, not getting, we are not getting back to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> You're not that close. <laughs> she will be nowhere near us. Go get some cookies. All right. I'll rephrase that. All right. So, you realize the people that tuned in did not get the cookie joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not my problem. <laughs> Apparently it's mine now. <laughs> All right. So here, one of the reasons that we started this is because um, we just actually just got tired. We got pissed off at hearing all the bad news constantly spewed out how messed up this country is, how you, know, you suck, he sucks, we all suck, and this country is doomed and all that. And I was like, no, you know, this isn't this isn't right, right? So we actually still believe in things like potential and possibility in this country and patriotism and we believe in the american dream and it's what we're trying to help people find it's what we're after ourselves so we like to ask people and i'll ask this from both of you sitting there whoever answers second has time to think about it um what is uh, what does the american dream mean to you like do you have an opinion on its viability and what it actually means yeah the possibilities are endless it doesn't matter what you look like or where you're from you can do anything you want as long as you keep the right attitude, stop listening to negativity, enjoy positivity. And and people have often asked me, how do I stay positive? My first advice is as soon as you get out of bed in the morning, um, do not turn on Twitter. Do not turn on Instagram. Do something active for 15 minutes, be it stretching or the elliptical. Then go ahead and make coffee. And then after that, if you need to get social media, do that. But say, don't start the day off with a negative attitude. It will ruin everything. Start to be positive. And like I said, none of us are getting out of this alive anyway. So might as well enjoy yourself. I agree, America. I mean, it's the land of opportunity. Um, nothing's given to you you got to work for it but you have the opportunity to work and a lot a lot of times success will follow hard work i mean i'm if it's it, it, you can do whatever you want in america. if america if america sucks so bad like the media likes to tell us that we do why is everyone trying to come here not a bunch of caravans heading from the united states to honduras if socialism is <laughs> so great why aren't we heading to honduras all right good answer good answer all right so last Last question, unless something else pops up from somebody watching, um, give them one more chance to get in. But if there was somebody that either of you right now, if we could hop off this interview and I could send somebody in this whole world that you have not met over to hang out and spend some time with you, who would that be? Larry Bird. The guy who peed on Rob's hands. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so again, Larry, Larry Bird. Bird. <laughs> Same, same guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I feel like if you got in touch with Larry Bird's people, Rob, he would come meet you. And Tom, I'm sure that well, guy would come pee on your hands, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can only hold. <laughs> can we, can we because I'd like it to be the opposite. Um, no, did you see the Instagram feed today where Tom was rooting for my thing and he found my John Rambo bag and Larry Bird warm-up that I have? Yeah. Well, a lifelong self. I grew up watching Larry Bird. I so I'm funny. in the guest room, and there's a Larry Bird warm up. Like, why? Yeah. Why wouldn't that be? Check, here? check the Makuya Instagram feed. Don't pay attention to the Bird and Ernie one. Don't, don't look. Don't at look that. at that. That was a bad idea. <laughs> bad. But we, no, we put the Larry Bird thing. He found the warm up. I did see that, but I still feel like you could actually meet Larry <laughs> Bird. I mean, you I found freaking Bin Laden. I think you could find Larry Bird. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I have faith in you. 
Okay. Um, are there any more questions that came in that we need to answer, Dave? Are there any more questions that came in that we need to answer? Okay. All right. So I'm going to thank the two of you for taking the time to sit down with us tonight. I think I laughed harder than I worked, but uh, it was good. It was good fun. And really, in all sincerity, thank you so much, Rob, for all you do. Thank you, Todd, for, for supporting him. I guess watching over him. Thank, thank you for your, uh, your yeah, family you. service. And, yes, Barb, thank you very much. You, you, are, uh, you are the definition yeah. to keep moving forward, which I've been saying all the time. Always keep moving forward. Feet on the ground. Keep moving forward one step at a time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's all you can do. Right. So I hope our paths cross again one day and we'll gotcha. send everybody towards your nonprofit and try to get, garner some support for that as well. Thanks so much. Right, thank, you. thank you. You guys have an excellent night. Thanks, good night, Dave. He said good night, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks so much.